Salam and peace. Uh, this is Imam Malik Mujahid, and you're watching. <coughs> excuse me, and you're watching Muslim Network TV on Galaxy 19 satellite. We're there 24/7, covering uh, the whole United States with 57 million subscribers. Go to Canada and Mexico. We're also on Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV. Raku and uh, uh, you can download our app uh, on your phones or our own website. If you are like uh, those people who watch everything on YouTube, uh, you can find us there, but do remember to subscribe. Well, as uh, uh, we're, uh, you know, historically first, uh, our president is being, uh, tried for uh, his being for the impeachment and uh, in the Senate. Uh, yesterday was the first day and one senator seems to be listening and he switched his vote. Rest of the people stayed where they were. Uh, so, and there is a diminishing faith in the uh, democratic politics uh, or our systems, especially about the uh, authenticity of the electoral system and all of that. So, so it is uh, another time when America seems to be falling apart, uh, dividing and difficult to talk, uh, different aisles in the churches, people in the family table, people avoiding topics, which essentially people need to talk about. To discuss that, we have an elected leader who has been in electoral politics for a while, but he wants to reform the system as well. We also have uh, a person who could quit his marketing job because he feels passionate that if people listen to each other, we will be better and uh, that will be divide. So we have uh, our guest today, Senator Christopher Pearson. Welcome to Thanks. Muslim Network TV. Thank you for having me. Great to be with you. Christopher Pearson is a state senator from Vermont, and uh, he has been director of presidential election reform program in the past and is still campaigning on uh, a popular vote uh, of things of this nature. We also have Pierce Godwin. Welcome to Muslim Network TV. Thank you so much for having me. And you know, at this network, we listen. Yes. Okay. So he, uh, Godwin is a uh, founder CEO of Listen First Project, which is which has brought 350 organization in America together across different divide uh, in a collaborative national conversation project. So, Senator, what is dividing our nation? Uh, are you divided in Vermont as much as the nation divided? Well, interesting. We have a Republican governor and our legislature at the state level controlled entirely by Democrats. So uh, somehow you we're the most uh, most powerful independent in the country there. as Yes. Well. Yes. So we uh, we seem to celebrate our divide and and push for ways for it to work together. Uh, in a way that uh, many of us are quite proud of. We're, we, we're not outside of the challenges in the modern times, but we have done our best to uh, force different factions to work together. Hmm. And, uh, and it is working out? Well, I mean, we have challenges in our economy. We're in the middle of a pandemic, like everybody. Um, so I, I can't celebrate it uh, across the board. But we have a lot of... Uh, spirit in Vermont and a lot of, frankly, an ability to come together in our small communities that does give us a, a strength, I think, uh, particularly evident in these challenging days. So, Piers, you have been to many states. Do you think Vermont people have better years? <laughs> you know, I, I was just thinking through that and, uh, and, and my limited experience in Vermont absolutely, you know, substantiates what, what Chris is saying. I think the lesson there is that wherever we are, you know, the United States is a big country. There's a lot of variety in many areas. So certainly different regions, different states, different communities have uh, different norms. Uh, and certainly my understanding and my experience in Vermont is that, that the norms there are more conducive to working together, to not getting quite so siloed and tribalized um, and seeing identities 
that, that are more important than, than, than some of these more limiting and othering identities we have. So I think we could all learn a lot from Vermont and, and how we interact with each other and the spirit we have to, to work together to solve our shared challenges. Oh boy, uh, you might move over there, Christopher. You'd be welcome. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, tell me this, Christopher, have we ever been uh, um, uh, so united uh, other than the national uh, crises which tend to unite people other than this pandemic it, it doesn't seem to unite people but uh, war time and all that people come together but uh, uh, what was your ideal time when people were united working with each other oh I, in goodness. other words when america was vermont before well um i, I think we have lost some ability to to talk and to come to the table uh, and, and even agree on a, a, a common set of problems. But you, you look at the post-Second World War era, the economy was much more spread out, helping people uh, across the board. You saw, I think, I think of it as a time of unity. It was before my day. But, um, you know, we, we, we are in a very uh, fractured time. I, I you know, uh, I worry about that, and I worry about um, not not coming forward with an agreed upon set of facts, where you then wrestle with what to do about the challenges. We don't seem to even be able to do that at the current time. Yeah, listening to a different set of facts uh, is uh, another type of a challenge. Uh, we will we'll come to that, but uh, is division necessarily bad? I mean, if civil war, people could not. He, uh, agree with each other, uh, went to war with each other, and brought some goodness to this uh, world. And uh, President Lincoln remains, uh, you know, a, a major leader of our country. And the Black Lives Matter movement uh, started challenging a whole lot of things in this yeah. country. And they brought conversation to a level uh, that it seems like country is being uh, divided. Uh, so is division necessarily an evil thing? Are you asking me? Um, <laughs> I, well, it, it, it is a, you know, a question which it seems you want to pass on. Sure. Well, no, I, I mean, I think if you could go back in time and ask people the lead up to the civil war if they wanted division i'm not sure people would say yes but you do see what i hear you talking about is is sometimes that division can lead to more positive outcomes and and you know that's true whether you're talking about a conflict within a family uh or in communities or or across the country you know this may be a process we have to go through as a people before we can begin to unify. Uh, maybe that division is important to make some advances, whether it's around racial equity, economic equity, et cetera. I'm just uh, very happy that you brought uh, family, mention a family in here. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, families are in pandemic are uh, spending more time with each other and more tension and more divorces and more conflict are coming. Uh, I hope uh, uh, nation and families both uh, are good in listening uh, to each other. Uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, we rarely talk about religion here, but he will not officiate a wedding without mentioning that you need to have clear, straightforward communication, and that will make your affairs good. So as you brought family and about listening project, as an imam, the first thing came to my mind is that. And I always, when I am forced to, I normally don't officiate weddings, but when I, some friend insists, and I make sure that that Prophet Muhammad's teaching, which he always do in his, uh, you know, wedding sermon of clear communication, and it will make your affairs better and God will forgive if there are some shortcomings. So listening is needed all over. And uh, so, so let's talk about it. Uh, is the voting by nature uh, a divisive thing? Um, I mean, I don't know what other process is there if there's no voting. People right. will go back to chopping head of their leaders. So, so <laughs> but, but is voting itself brings that type of tension and or is not the voting at the party system? 
I think, you know, voting chooses people to pick a side. And in this country, we sort of think of it as two sides. So, um, but historically, you've seen right after a change in leadership, actually a time of unity. And and even you see it now around Joe Biden has, has got relatively popular support. Uh, but I, I'm interested in talking about the way we vote and the way the Electoral College works, I think, today. And I work on a project, National Popular Vote to change the way the Electoral College works, use the Electoral College, but to create a popular vote where every vote is equal, you get the most votes, you win. If we had national popular vote, I don't think we would be as divided as we are today. The, the current setup with the red and blue states would have you believe that everybody in Kansas is a Republican. There are a lot of Democrats in Kansas. Would have you believe that everybody in California is a Democrat. There are a lot of Republicans in California. And, and so the way the me mechanics for electing the president, I think, amplifies the divide, leaves 70 percent or more of the voters in this country kind of on the sidelines. And we can talk about that and, and really does create a, a problem where we're, we're uh, the voice of people coming forward and exercising their choice at the ballot box does not always translate to who, who takes the White House, creates a lot of uh, bad faith in our system, and I think um, is a bit of a cancer on, on the, our election process across the board, and stems, you know, it is the highest profile uh, election that we have, and, and so creates uh, challenges for those of us running at, at much lower levels of office, uh, and, and, and calls into question our system overall. So I, I've been for many years working uh, on national popular vote, which is advancing through the country is about 70%, a little over 70% of the way to reforming the way the electoral college works and creating a popular vote for president. So you, you think that the electoral system, uh, not the voting process, it's electoral system, dividing the country. I mean, that, that's, I wonder if somebody had that line, we're not red America and blue America, we're the United States of America. Yes. So people thought that was a message of unity. Yes. So, so this red is, do you think if the popular vote is, then America will be, uh, how, how they will be, I mean, you cannot liberate yourself from colors, can you? <laughs> that's right. And, and uh, well, just, just imagine a map for me. What map will look like if it's a popular vote? Sure, it will be a purple map, uh, as, as we are a purple country. And and you know, uh, some data to highlight this: Donald Trump got more votes out of California mm -hmm. uh, than he did out of Texas. You know, so so we we have long been trained to watch for this red and blue map that that is, uh, after all, one color, one red or blue. It betrays the fact that 70% of the country lives in a red state or a blue state and are basically taken for granted as such. Here in Vermont, we're a comfortable blue state. Candidates ignore us. Um, they take us for granted. Uh, that, so we, we have a system that highlights the battleground states. It's a very small number of states, about 12 states accounted for 94% of the last election. When you look at where the campaign is engaged, and we had a, an election, Joe Biden won by 7 million votes, over 7 million votes. And for weeks, we were living on an edge because of a margin of about 46,000 votes in Wisconsin, Arizona, and Georgia could have flipped the outcome. We were 23,000 votes away. If 23,000 Americans had changed their mind and they happened to live in those states, we would have reelected Trump. And he won, he lost, excuse me, by over 7 million votes. If that doesn't create a divide then or exacerbate a divide, then I can't imagine of a system that would, would amplify the divide more. And I do think it undermines uh, the need for us to come together when, after all, it wasn't close. The country was not close at all in terms of who should be taking the White House. Hmm. Well, we're going to take a short break, but I'm, you know, you being a senator from Vermont, you brought Vermont name again. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I like to know a little more about that. So as we come back, I like to know if it is a comfortably blue state, 
uh, how come your listening devices have allowed you to a Republican elected? I mean, uh, you know, there, there must be some dynamics there. Uh, it's helps to understand uh, how people can still be in a state with a Republican uh, senator and an independent senator and the House is all Democratic and the uh, governor is uh, all uh, Republican. So you're listening to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid and we're talking with Senator from Vermont, Christopher Pearson and Piers Godwin. And we'll be right back after these messages. My name is Adam. You remember me. I appeared in so many episodes that Sound Vision has put on the market. No matter what. It oh, no. Hey, what's happening? Hey, oh, sorry. Lockdown is what it is. Well, continuing here. In this lockdown, Sound Vision never stops thinking about you, the viewer. We'll have to get back into production again, online and in line. Everybody in their own space, e even me. Although I'm stuck with Lenisa. Salam! <laughs> Salam! Salam! <laughs> I, know, I know, you were shocked too. Well, l let me continue. Uh, this, is, um, this is what I was going to say. Salam! 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 Cut! 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 <sighs> Finally, I get my own screen time again. Thank God. And so we invested in new equipment to bring you even better production with new songs and new singers and animations. Well, here are a few clips. And Sound Vision has brought all this into your home, making Islamic values and teachings easy. And if you know me, Adam, a multi-talented actor, <laughs> well, sometimes I'm an actor and, and the reporter and the... Oh, that's enough. Let's move on to the next section. Well, you can watch these new episodes on our new app at www.adamsworldapp.com. We have previews happening every day on Muslim Network TV. Sound Vision has been serving generations, moving and changing with the times. We are all faithfully connected. That is a huge blessing. Your donation helps keep these programs available now and into the future. We take this job of helping tomorrow's Muslims today seriously, and you should too. Today, we need your help. Children absorb and learn from everything they encounter. Make that wholesome, positive, grounded in our faith, Together, we can accomplish our goal of raising better Muslims, better neighbors, and better citizens. Please donate generously. It's an investment in our future. But to finish, let me tell you there are new scripts of my new mission. And it is something that I enjoy talking about. My new mission is space. Houston, we do not have a problem. <laughs> Salam, see you soon.
Welcome back. This is uh, Imam Malik Mujahid. I'm talking with Senator Christopher Pearson and Pierce Godwin. Uh, so tell us in Wisconsin, um, you know, you have this similar electoral system as anybody else, but not many states uh, produce a variety of candidates. Uh, you know, your Republican governor and state legislature is all Democrats and you think it's a blue state. So how a Republican uh, rose as a senator and as an independent candidate uh, from Vermont as a senator of the United Nations, while it is a comfortably blue state, it, you say? Sure. Well, New England has a, a tradition of electing Republican governors. You see that right now in Massachusetts. Uh, it's, it's been the case in Connecticut recently uh in maine recently uh so so we in vermont histor historically we will switch between a democratic and a republican governor but for uh the great majority of the last 30 40 years the bulk of the legislature has been made up of democrats uh and our congressional delegation um, sending to Washington has been either, uh, our, of course, independent Bernie Sanders, but uh, caucuses with the Democrats and and uh, to the left, let's say. So we 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 have historically though had uh, Republican governors um, intermingled with Democratic governors, and and Vermonters do like some of that uh, divide. They 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 want that check. So voters seems to be splitting their votes. It seems yes. What variables uh, does it connect with? There's the higher level of education, more college-going people, or skepticism about all politicians, or want to see cockfights? They, I think it, it correlates to time, and it swings back and forth. Uh, if you look at the last 30 years in Vermont politics, we have a Democrat. When the Democrat steps down, we have a Republican uh, in terms of the governor. And, and you see something similar in Massachusetts, often Connecticut, Rhode Island, Maine. So it, it is something of a New England thing, I think. Uh, um, but uh, I'm not a historian in that sense. But my observation is voters tend to swing back and forth. So let me ask, uh, Pierce, if, uh, if election, election system is switch in a way that uh, you know electoral system, you know the people one person one vote popular vote elects the national leaders do you think it will reduce the divide i'm so grateful for the work that senator pearson is doing and looking closely at, at this issue it's one of several that that undoubtedly you know contribute to our divide there's so many of these kind of structural issues whether it be the way in which uh, we are electing presidents, which Senator Pearson is focused on, or the way in which we're drawing districts, uh, the way in which we're having those elections themselves in terms of primaries versus general elections, and, and the incentives, right? Well, we're all human beings at the end of the day, and, and as Senator Pearson uh, can attest as a, as a politician himself, you know, they're human beings too, and, and they have certain interests, and they have certain incentives, and it's very easy for us non-politicians to point and say, oh, those people have broken it or those people are the problem. And it's just not true. We need to start by looking in the mirror. But but absolutely, uh, those incentives are broken uh, on, on many issues across the board that are just exacerbating the problem. And are as I've reflected on, you know, more recently with some friends, because I did used to work on, on Capitol Hill and in politics, um, I fear that that the only thing we have left, I'd be curious if Senator Pearson agrees, um, is relying on just the, the integrity, the, uh, the the real core principles that a politician may hold, because I fear that our systems and our voters and our thirst for division um, and our thirst for tribalism and us versus them is really creating all the wrong incentives for our politicians to come together. Hmm. Hmm. So uh, do you agree, Christopher? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I, again, I've been focused on the way we elect the president, and I do think that is particularly uh, exacerbates the divide we have. I mean, if you live in New York, the major, major state, you, you, the center of the sort of worldwide economy in New York City, completely take it for granted, 
by presidential elections because it's a safe blue state. So it's not like Joe Biden campaigned in New York. He took them for granted. And so did Donald Trump because Donald Trump couldn't win. Joe Biden had already won. This is uh, uh, leaves a, a lot of Americans out and, and completely undermines our faith in our process where Joe Biden won by 7 million votes. And we sat around for weeks wondering if he was going to go to the White House. How, if, if you're 30 or under in this country, you've spent most of your life watching the person in the White House not have gotten received the most votes in the country. This eats at the faith of our system. And, and before we talk about what kind of people could we get there or, or could we have a better dialogue, I believe we ought to have a system that is straightforward and widely accepted as fair. And that has to be based on every vote being equal. You get the most votes, you win. And right now, that is not the case in the way we elect the president. And the whole conversation about what are the issues people are debating since presidential mm -hmm. candidates are leading that uh, debate, that debate sometimes doesn't exist. I mean, being in Illinois, our television and all that doesn't have, uh, you know, Biden and Trump uh, advertisement bringing some issues here and there. When I go to Virginia, I get to watch all of that, uh, that what they're talking about. So, so it seems that uh, what Christopher, you are saying, it's not the, just the popular vote, but the national conversation in which all individuals are participating, listening, uh, talking about it, considering their vote uh, uh, matters, and then voting on that basis, thinking that my vote will count. Is that the whole set? Yeah, well, this is deeply, deeply important. And I'll give you another example. And, and I'm glad you brought up different states, because in Illinois, safe blue state, both sides take them for granted. In Vermont, we're a reliable blue state. If you want to get involved in a presidential election, you get in your car and drive to New Hampshire. Because New Hampshire could go either way. They could go red, could go blue. That is incredibly disempowering to Vermont voters. Because after all, only a very, very small number of people are going to bother to get in their car and drive you know, a couple hours to go knock doors in New Hampshire. Now, if every vote was equal across the country and you could talk to your neighbor about your preferred candidate, Maybe you bring them on board, maybe you wouldn't, but you would feel ownership over the process. That's what I really worry about is that the current system, because it leaves, you know, 35 to 40 states are safe, red and blue. And so they're ignored, taken for granted. And because we now fairly routinely watch the second place candidate take the White House, this is very disempowering to the country. And um, and that it, it's hard to know. It's hard to quantify the damage that's having and the, the impact on our debate. But I promise you, we're not debating the broad range of issues that matter to the country. We're debating the, the narrow range of issues that happens to matter to Florida and Pennsylvania. And, and so this is to your point, uh, sir, about Illinois, for instance, we don't talk much about the Great Lakes, except that if Michigan is in play, and so maybe we talk about the Great Lakes in a national discussion, um, you know, the, 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 it's really, really broken. We're really disconnected for, for a vast, vast majority of Americans uh, in terms of the candidates and the debate and what matters to most people. So, Piers, a popular mm -hmm. vote seems to... Uh, engage more people in more conversations. Uh, 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 does it make sense to you? Certainly on that front, it does. I, I don't, I don't feel, feel equipped to give a, a final verdict, but I think it's a very intriguing idea. Senator Pearson you know, makes a lot of compelling points. Um, but I think anything we're doing that is, is expanding the engagement in the system is expanding the engagement in the conversation is critical. And, and Senator Pearson said a couple of things that, that relate so directly to, to my focus, which is on what we're doing as individuals. And kind of one way to look at it is, is that I feel like there are two broken relationships in America. Uh, one is our relationship with one another, and the other is our relationship with our government. And I think Senator Pearson is doing such incredible work focused on that relationship with the government, relationship with our representation, how we are electing 
our presidents and other candidates. Um, but he also touched on the idea of trust, whether it's trust in the system or trust in one another. And also, as I mentioned, that engagement. And, and indeed, I feel like that is the problem as far as what I focus on in our interpersonal relationships is that distrust, fear, and contempt have poisoned our society and those personal relationships. I would submit that a brighter future requires understanding, requires that trust and some level of grace for one another. So that's why my focus is on growing a movement to heal America by building those relationships, by bridging divides, and ultimately transforming this division and, and contempt that has ramifications through the work we're talking about today and everything. We're not able to solve our shared challenges because we can't even come to the table together because we are so convinced that it is their fault and they are the problem. And who would, depending on who you're talking to, they could look very, very differently. But wanting to transform that division and contempt into some level of connection and understanding. And I'll also note, you know, the, the conversation earlier about division. Uh, it, it's pretty wild to realize that in the you know 50s, uh, the experts were saying there is not enough division in politics. You know, really, the, the parties were kind of a bit mixed up. They were very regionalized. But more recently, certainly, we've had uh, what's considered this purification uh, of the parties and also them becoming what's considered mega identities in which there are so many important uh, variables uh, and points of diversity in America from partisanship to geography to race to religion, but they've all kind of gotten squished together in many ways um, that has created what we think of as toxic polarization. And that's where I would argue we've gone from helpful and productive division and disagreement and dissent and the democratic society to something that, that is really a threat. And, and also it was mentioned earlier, can we come together without that external threat? There's this concept of asteroid theory. You and I might be arguing vociferously, and then we look up in the sky and there's an asteroid coming. Suddenly, you and I are shoulder to shoulder, right? We're on the same team. We haven't seen that dynamic in America since 9-11. And you mentioned that you know we might have thought the pandemic would be that, would be that threat that would bind us together in shared destiny and in shared consideration for one another. And for a hot second, it did. Right in April, there was incredible polling on the degree to which we felt united and we felt like we could come together. And boy, that what was that fleeting. Uh, so we're left with this toxic polarization, which I would in simple terms describe as a self-destructive and crippling level of division and demonization. And we mentioned families. I think that toxic polarization is a grave threat to all Americans, to our families, to our communities and to our country. Our variety ultimately I think could be America's glory, not its downfall. It could be another exceptional trait that we all take a lot of pride in. Uh, but right now, we're, we're, we're far too apt to, to dehumanize and to find our identity in opposition to another group. Yeah, you mentioned 9-11. And as a Muslim, you know, uh, my take is a little different. I mean, I'm saying a Muslim, but to the level that a uh, a FBI in charge of counterterrorism told me that 500,000 Muslims were interviewed by FBI. It wow. terrorized the whole neighborhoods, uh, but that is different. Nation was together, but the enemy seems to be their neighbor instead of somewhere else. Uh, we'll be right back after these messages. We were talking about with uh, about a division in the country, how it, it could our electoral system could be improved and how we can talk to each other better. With me are Senator Christopher Pearson and Piers Godwin. We'll be right back after these messages.
my wife who uh, she's a professor at the University of Cincinnati who, who's Catholic and by her watching and listening to our three-year-old son uh, watch Adam's World she ended up taking Kalima Shahada she embraced Islam because she learned so much about Islam and the other prophets it really affected our life in a great way and because of uh, sound vision in Adam's world, we're Muslims. I took my Shahada 15 years ago, and I actually am from a rural part of Ohio. And so I found the catalog for sound vision, and I ordered the, the tapes and the CDs and the books, and I used those, and especially for my little daughter. You know, that's how we basically learned our Islam, and Islam entered our hearts through the wonderful works of, of sound vision. Okay, assalamu alaikum, brother. I just want you to know that I love the sound vision website, that a lot of times when I'm looking for information, especially as it relates to homelessness, domestic violence, and women issues, I go to that website, and then I see what you've written, and then I copy and paste it, and spread the word, because the wisdom is there. So I can't, you know, I can't do any better than what sound vision has already done. Sound Vision is our survival uh, uh, guide. It is the uh, organization that provides skills for Muslims how to survive and thrive in this uh, community here in the U.S. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Anam, I'm in 11th grade and I grew up with Adam's World and what it taught me was unity, respect and love for the Muslim Ummah. Is Adam's World is the greatest show ever made. Take me to the Kaaba, man. I love that puppet. Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and we're talking with Senator Pearson and Pierce Godwin about our uh, division in the country and how political systems can improve that. In Vermont, uh, how accessible is your governor mm -hmm. to Democrats? Well, I, I would say we're a very small state, right? We have 630,000 people. So um, most people, if they've wanted to, have met one of our U.S. senators. They've met our representative in Congress, Peter Welch, and they can bump into the governor, I mean, outside of the pandemic uh, with some frequency. The state house where I work, um, my committee is uh, one of my committees has five senators, one has seven. We sit around a table like a dinner table and have our conversations and, and guests come in and, and sit at the end and give us some uh, wisdom, their, their point of view. So it is very open in that way. Um, we have been learning though that of course, during the pandemic, everybody, we're, we're fully remote. We do all of our work now through Zoom, which is good and bad. But it has enabled uh, many, many more people in some ways to engage because they can be at home and dial in for half an hour and, and share some insight with us. Whereas previously we made them get in their car and drive to Montpelier a few hours to, to really participate. So um, on one hand, we're very proud of being open, uh, of bumping into leaders at the grocery store, what have you. Uh, on the other hand, the pandemic's revealed some work we have to do to make sure our state uh, facilities are open in a, in a more accessible uh, for people that work during the day, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, but the governor, to, you know, the governor's a decent man. He, he's I could I could knock on his door or at least talk to his staff. I can email his his commissioners and get an answer back. Um, we don't have a lot of staff. I don't have a single person that works just for me as a state senator. Um, and so that creates a lot of actually collaboration directly between mm -hmm. senators, House members, and people in the, in the governor's administration in a way that I, I'm very proud of is kind of special. Sometimes it's frustrating. I'd love to have help talking mm -hmm. to constituents and answering some of those, those services. But our small scale actually keeps it very interpersonal and open. Wow. So there is a beauty in being small. 
Yeah, there's a simplicity, I think. Yeah. I'm in, in Illinois, you know, talking to a senator, forget about that, but talking mm -hmm. to a congressperson, it's it just a extraordinary uphill battle. So what about um, uh, for more conversation and more responsibility, uh, dividing up all the largest states into smaller chunks? <laughs> Yeah, but, well, we. <laughs> well, it's it's probably slightly more uh, difficult idea than your idea of popular votes, but but just look at it. People being able to directly listen to each other and work with each other. Uh, I mean, what, was this the power of city states when city states used to be something in the history? Well, let me say one of the reasons I like national popular vote is it's it is happening it's well over 16 states have en enacted our bill including illinois um i like the idea that americans have long wanted a popular vote and we've long uh, looked at that red blue map every four years and scratched our head and explained to our kids well that's the electoral college uh i don't like it i want to have a popular vote i like the idea that we could deliver this change and what an empowering feeling that would be for Americans who who do recognize our systems are very locked in, very, very, uh, you know, set in stone. And it feels like, well, we should obviously change that, but we can't. I don't know how you begin to do that. Um, I like the the feeling of of that dramatic change where instead of 12 battleground states, the whole country is engaged and people would say, hey, we did that. Hey, this is our thing. This is our democracy. We own this. They work for us. That, to me, is uh, very, very potent. And would... well, tell, me, tell me this. Among the states who have approved that, is there any so-called red state? There, there have been some success in red states, but not all the way. So the, uh, the Oklahoma Senate passed our bill. The Arizona House passed our bill. Um, it, we've, we've had advances in Missouri and Georgia, uh, elsewhere, Michigan. Uh, and New York, the Senate was controlled by Republicans when the bill went to the governor. Uh, but I'll be frank and say, since the Trump election in 2016, our issue has become much more polarized. Uh, but you just saw in 2020, last November, we were on the ballot in, in Colorado. We had bipartisan support there. We passed the ballot. Uh, Colorado uh, stayed with us uh, as part of the agreement. So it's not inherently partisan at all. The idea is one person, one vote, get the most votes you win. That's broadly supported. But in terms of parties and which leaders are willing to advance our bill right now, we, we do see a partisan divide. Hmm. I mean, I see that. I mean, when, when it should become partisan, it becomes very difficult to get I mean, just look at the, um, the climate change issue. Yeah. It became a partisan issue and people mm -hmm. stopped listening. And that's where I think the listen first movement come in. But is listen first movement, I mean, I have been chair of the parliament of the world religions and a lot of uh, different religions and tens of thousands of people engage in there. I find it to be a realm of essentially uh, liberals, uh, you know, listening to each other. But is listen first movement, for example, you did something in Charlottesville. I don't know. It was before that incident, major incident, or after that. It was, that, after. It was after. That listening. Did you have uh, people who were neo Nazis and who were marching, and you were listening to them? No, it, we did not go that far. And 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 candidly, uh, this is always a tension, right? It is where do you draw that line? Um, I, I would submit that that we as Americans in our national conversation right now are drawing the line about who's worthy to be listened to far too narrowly, right? Uh, even within the same so-called tribe, you know, if, if you don't agree with me 100%, you are the enemy. And I think that is not good for anybody. It is not going to get us anywhere. But uh, so listen I, to this. I'm in writing in the uh, USA Today, you wrote, uh, we must, I mean, the title uh, article is uh, American Experience is Failing. Uh, and I quote, we must boldly and bravely confront the long legacy of racism, bigotry, and all means of othering our neighbors, unquote. Well, this is all liberal talk. So how are you going to get uh, listenership on the other side? Yeah, well, uh, for one thing. I mean, uh, don't take me wrong. I'm on yeah. your side on this. 
<laughs> yeah, but, but but for one thing, in full transparency, um, I'm a conservative. I used to work in Republican politics. So, uh, you know, where I'm coming from is a concern for our country and, and for and, and from a concern for uh, my fellow Americans. And uh, again, I'll follow the Senator Pearson's lead in, in, in being frank about the dynamics here. That there is something, and I've studied it deeply, and as someone who does still consider myself a, a conservative, I'm quite passionate about ensuring that we have that political diversity of representation, because um, as I love to remind my, my liberal and democratic friends, you don't mend the frayed fabric of America with the 60% who didn't approve of former President Trump. That's not how math works. So it is critically important that whether it's the work that Senator Pearson is doing around the broken relationship with America and its government, or what I'm doing in the broken relationship with America and each other, that all sides and all tribes are coming to the table. Um, and, and I think just to pick up briefly on, on a couple of, uh, of things that you all were just talking about, uh, it, it is so unfortunate that, that issues that should not be polarized, should not suddenly get encamped in one tribe or another do. Uh, but I think you know one explanation is that we're so quick, and it's very easy to see in the work around national popular vote, to think not necessarily on the merits of an idea, but what's that going to mean for my team? What's the short-term implication going to be for my team? Is this going to be a win or a loss for me? A win or a loss in this zero-sum world for the other guys and gals? Um, and that's where we have got to somehow begin to care more about our broader interest, about our longer-term interest, and consider what really reflects the values that we want to have as a society and as a nation. And, and just one more point on, uh, on that. You talked about you know, could we go local and could we have the kind of access and the kind of engagement uh, that's enjoyed in Vermont? I think there's a really important truth there. And it's something that came out in polling post-election when there was a lot of mistrust around the election. When you remind folks that this is not some uh, mythical election system in a very admittedly daunting and huge United States of America, but it's your neighbors who are managing the election system. It's your neighbors that are doing the counting, that are ensuring the integrity. Anytime we bring things closer to home, closer to our lived experience, uh, we're going to be able to, to have a little bit more trust, to have more engagement. So I think there's a really important principle there about getting out of the food fight and the us versus them. When I love asking people, who is them? Who is it? Like whenever somebody says, they, they want to do this, but let's, let's bring it home. Let's understand ourselves uh, as Americans, extend a little grace uh, and, and begin to see one another in a way that will allow us to move forward together more productively. So Piers, have you been successful in getting conservatives and liberals to talk? I can tell you at the Parliament of the World Religion, uh, which, uh, you know, I'm my, uh, you know, sort of a uh, person, I said, you know, we're just talking among ourselves. We believe in dialogue, except we just dialoguing among our, ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I tried to bring some conservative, I actually brought some evangelical people to speak, but but I felt uh, they, 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 I, I mean, they didn't tell me, I felt they felt that they were not in a right place. Mm -hmm. so, so it's odd and difficult. So have you been successful in getting uh, conservatives and liberals to honestly talk on issues on which they disagree? Yes, and, and I'll note that really my core focus now is, is elevating and amplifying the many efforts across the country that are bringing Americans together across difference. So as you noted in the intro, there are over 250 organizations who are in our Listen First Coalition, and, and candidly, some do a better job than others. Some are very uh, deliberate and, and as, as a matter of imperative that they won't hold a conversation, if you will, unless they have an equal balance of liberals, conservatives, Democrats, Republicans, however you want to classify. Um, there are others who don't make quite that concerted effort and without getting too far into the weeds unless you want to, but you know, I've put together a whole 15 page playbook on how to better engage conservatives. It's not because conservatives, I hope, because I still am one, um, I have, have some you know, evil or antagonistic tendency um, but it, it is in the messaging, and, and you touched on this. It, it, it's in it's in what it, what kind of uh, event and opportunities does this sound like? It, it, and far too often, um, a number of, of of the people who are most drawn to this field do have more uh, 
liberal collectivist tendencies, which is wonderful. There's nothing wrong with that, but it can come through. We've all become so darn sensitive to even word choices. And like we, and, and we can just sniff out as soon as we hear a certain word, oh, that's them, right? Back to that them. So you have to be so careful with your wording so that even the invitation is inviting. That, that's where the hang up has been is from a conservative perspective, which again, I, I resonate with, all right, what is this, right? Just some little kumbaya thing. We're gonna get together, smoke a peace pipe, you know, hang out. Um, and, and, and that may feel like just not my thing, not something I, there's all sorts of neurological research about this, but perhaps not something that, that a conservative would find all that inviting. And they may expect, and unfortunately may be right, that they'd be one of the few conservatives in the conversation, right? That they would be uh, outnumbered. So that's the, that's the most critical thing is uh, framing an invitation in a way that resonates across the tribes. But what I've seen again and again and again and again is if you get people to the table, and this isn't just the work of, of coming together across differences, but really anything. Um, when you get people to the table, we're all human. And I think the vast majority of us have goodwill uh, and, and want to relate well with those, especially uh, when we're pers uh, face to face in person. And uh, so once people come to the table, it's always been you know, tremendously successful, but there is a real challenge not just with conservatives, but anytime you're you're framing an invitation that that it's welcoming and that it feels like a place that I would want to be. Well, let me ask both of you about a, something which I am quite concerned at this moment. You know, after 9/11, things which were done, America still does not know uh, the whole lot of things. I asked some senator and Congress persons. Can you get me the information? How many Americans were interviewed? How many, uh, you know, a lot of that information is not available to even senators. Uh, now that uh, uh, we have this right wing uh, extremist or uh, however you want to describe the militias and things of uh, that nature with different vocabulary Suddenly there is a, uh, you know, all of that is considered hate speech, accounts being suspended. Uh, you put on a Facebook or Twitter something, uh, even if you are not part of any of those groups, it suddenly it goes away, a warning is issued to you. Uh, I mean, while you're preaching for better listening, and in Vermont, people can have one-on-one -on -one communication much more easily than uh, probably in, a, you know, definitely in Illinois or any larger state. What I'm concerned was that overreaction after 9-11 gave us secret evidence that you could be tried and your evidence will not be known to you, which is still in place, by the way, in the book. Obama signed into the contract in, into NDAA, um, uh, which says that a US citizen can be detained indefinitely without a trial. He wrote one nice note that my administration will not implement, but it is, is still the law. Several hundred Muslim charities were invaded uh, without any accountability whatsoever. I mean, we just became a lawless nation trying to achieve peace. What I'm quite concerned when I see now this thing ban, that thing ban, um, uh, you know, simple Facebook uh, post of different people who are not talking violence, just have an opinion. So are we going now in a way towards a broad population. American Muslim over just uh, five, six million people, mm -hmm. but we're talking about 75 million people, 74 million or 75 million who voted for President Trump. And not all of them, of course, violent, but, but I'm quite concerned about uh, the freedom, freedom of speech component, uh, which is connected with listening to each other, even if a difficult conversation. So I like both of you to reflect on that, that how we can, uh, you know, not allow a, 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 a violent, uh, resulting in violence talk uh, and, and be little restrained that we do not uh, suppress. Because when you suppress people's voices, uh, they will look for other means, which may hurt themselves or other people or their neighbors. Right. 
Sorry for this long thing, but no. it's bothering me quite a bit. Pierce, uh, take it away. Sure. Okay. Um, I I so appreciate the the comparison you drew, uh, but between the overreach in, into and against the the Muslim population with nine eleven and what we now see happening you know, with folks on the right, particularly folks you know supportive of former President Trump, I think it's very easy. In a given situation, this gets back to our earlier point about short term versus long term to say, yeah, 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 let's let, let's shut down those voices. I don't like those voices. I don't want to hear them. Um, but taking just a second, right, to, to think about when you or someone you do agree with ends up on the wrong side of that in, in some other time, I, I think should give us a tremendous amount of pause. I mean, I personally always want to err on the side of, of freedom of speech. And leaving aside the fact that private businesses are not beholden you know, to the Constitution, they're not government entities, and entities. But regardless of all that, there's a value question for us as Americans uh, right now. Um, I tend to completely agree with, with your premise, which is the marketplace of ideas, the free exchange of ideas is how we is how some win, <laughs> quite frankly, and, and, and how some end up governing our values. As you noted, I don't think we're getting anywhere. I think, you know, talking about Charlottesville, I think Charlottesville and more recently, the Capitol on January 6th was a manifestation of what happens when certain views are repressed. And they may not be right in front of my face, but they're not, they haven't been vanquished. They haven't disappeared. They're festering somewhere. They're growing. And then something happens, some environmental shift, and they're ready to come out and be heard. So what's the end game of, of shutting up our fellow Americans? I do think there's a line, and I, I, I've used to joke to friends, that, oh, I wish Facebook would ban this or ban that. I would say, I'm glad I'm not Mark Zuckerberg. Because I don't know how you draw that line. And there's such a slippery slope risk. I, I will submit that the violence, right, and the excite, incitement thereof, and incitement, now we have another slippery slope. But, but certainly in the realm of violence, um, that is where I think we can draw the line. That's where the Supreme Court has drawn the line. But we are drawing the line so much more narrowly than that. And I think it's extremely dangerous for our country. So, Senator, you have uh, uh, 30 seconds if you have okay. some thoughts on that. Well, I think it's it's also important to look ahead, right? Not look back always and say, what did we do wrong? Where are those divides? But look ahead and, and, and leadership that says, you know what? We need an economy that isn't leaving 80% of us behind, for instance. I think that could be a unifying principle. Um, and, and I think the fact is that some of these outcroppings, the extremism that we're seeing, really does come back to an economy that has completely left us in shattered while the stock market is exploding. Um, you know, we need something to get unified and aim for. Uh, and I, I think that would help bring people together and, and maybe start to minimize some of the areas where we disagree. Because after all, if poll after poll shows, there's a lot of places where Americans are quite unified. Wow. And most of that comes back to family and security and, and you know, a roof over your head and not struggling to, to pay for food and, and pay for your basic needs. Well, thank you so much for your time. You have been both uh, amazingly focused on what you are doing and uh, that reflected in this conversation. So thank you, Senator Christopher Pearson, thank uh, you. state senator from Vermont. I like whole America to be like that. <laughs> that much, you know. Well, I got a lot of snow in Chicago as well. And thank you so much, Pierce Goodwin, uh, founder and CEO of Listen First Project. Thank you so much. And Muslim Network TV is all about talking and listening to each other. You know, everybody else is talking about Islam and Muslims. It's mm -hmm. about time that we talk as well. So thank you so much for watching us. Stay tuned for other programs. You have been watching Muslim Network TV on Galaxy 19 Satellite and uh, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Raku, and our own uh, apps, which you can download, or our website, muslimnetwork.tv. Peace, salam, and stay tuned for other programming.